Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast. And this is another one of those Asian movie collection addendum videos. Now this one is the big horror uh, pickups haul. Uh, various movies and purchases that I've made throughout the year. Then I'm going to do another uh, pickups video at the end of the month, I'm hoping. Because I should have the Criterion Godzilla box set that should arrive before the end of the month and if it does then i'll uh i'll show you what that's going to look like so you'll get a good kind of early look at that and see what it actually looks like in physical form instead of just looking at the pictures on the criterion site so that one's that's probably my biggest purchase of the year biggest single purchase for sure so hopefully we'll uh we'll get that in during october as well now this video there's some big pickups in this video as well. I got some big time Japanese releases, uh, some Hong Kong releases, uh, one mainland China release, a few Korean ones, an Indonesian television series, and then a whole other batch of like Japanese horror films as well, all horror movies. So that's, uh, better get started here. Let's knock out the big ones right off the bat. And, uh, one of the big ones here is the Arrow Ring Collection. Yes, the Ring Collection. Now, this is the Region B Blu-ray release. Um, so you'll need, if you live in America, you'll need a separate Blu-ray player and set it to Region B, or you'll need an all-region Blu-ray player to play this, because this was released, this is the UK release. Now, at the end of this month, Arrow is releasing the Region A version of this. And let me look right now. On Amazon, the Region A release releases on October 29th of 2019. And I'll tell you all the special features and stuff on this. However, one reason I got the Region B release is that it's half the price. You could get it on Amazon new for like 30 bucks. Uh, I, I don't remember what the shipping was though. Whereas the Region A release is pre-ordered at like 67 bucks, So it's twice as much if you want the Region A right now. But uh, yeah, the Ring Collection, this is a big one. Now, one big reason I bought this is that I only have one of these movies in my collection. Only one. Uh, the original Ring. Now I have seen, of course, Ring 2, Ring 0, and uh, Raisin. However... Um, I do not have all of those in my collection, so I had to basically add them to my collection at some point because this is such a huge um, franchise. And I was going to get the Ring, uh, what was it called? The Ring Anthology of Terror collection, but that's even more expensive than this because it's been out of print for so long. So uh, yeah, I had to get this. So now I have all four of the original four Ring movies, the Japanese ones at least. So let's take a look at what's in here. Now you have three different DVDs and a booklet. So let's look at the booklet first here. This booklet's actually quite heavy. You can tell it's good quality uh, print paper that they printed it on. So this book, it's called The Ring Collection, of course, and it... It is 58 pages long, and here's the chapters for it. Here's the uh, table of contents. You have Sadako's Impossible Moves, written by Violet Luca. You have some credits, ring credits. Then you have Ring, This Vortex of Evil Energy, by Alexandra Heller Nicholas. Then we have Spiral Credits which is Raisin, that's the other name for Raisin is Spiral. Then you get Spiral Out of the Loop by Jasper Sharp, who always does good stuff. He's one of those Midnight Eye guys. Ring 2 credits. And then Exploring the Chaos and Technophobia in Ring 2 by Kieran Fisher. Ring 0 credits. And then If I Could Be Reborn, Becoming Sadako by Kat Ellinger. Then you have about the restoration and then about the transfer. So this is this is jam-packed. I got to read this. Uh, I haven't really read it yet. I just kind of sifted through it. 
So there's a lot of information. There's basically a special write-up on each movie and uh, kind of an analysis on each film, it looks like, which is pretty cool. So yeah, this book is huge. And let me let me just read the uh, the restoration. It's been exclusively restored by Arrow Films and presented in its, its original aspect ratio. The original 35 millimeter camera negative element was scanned in 4K resolution. Then you get Spiral Ring Two and Ring Zero. These are presented in their original 185 aspect ratio and high-definition masters that were provided by Kadokawa Corporation. So, looks pretty good, man. So I will definitely read this book. That is a good special feature. A lot of content in it. Now let's look at the actual releases here. Now, the way they structure it, you have Ring, and you can see her uh, kind of in the background there, getting out of the well. And you have ring two, where she's getting closer to you. And then you get ring zero, and she's coming through your TV set. <laughs> so I kind of like, I like these designs. They're pretty cool. I like the white in the, it's like a white and bright bluish and dark bluish kind of uh, collection there. Now, the reason why you don't see rosin is because it's a special feature on one of these, uh, on one of these, which one is it on? Ah, uh, it's on this one. So on the Blu-ray of Ring 2, it also includes rosin. So that's where the uh, where rosin is located. So, special features here. On the first ring, all right, we got a new audio commentary by film historian David Collat. We have The Ring Legacy, a series of new interviews from critics and filmmakers on their memories of Ring and its enduring legacy. We have A Vicious Circle, a new video interview with author and critic Kat Ellinger on the career of Hideo Nakata. And then we have Circumnavigating Ring, a new video essay by author and critic Alexandra Heller Nicholas on the evolution of the Ring series. They have a separate feature just with Sadako's video on it. You got some trailers and a reversible sleeve. So yeah, this this uh, this release has got a bunch of special features, and I believe the Region A release is going to be the same exact thing, <clears throat> just a different region code. <clears throat> now, I think I watched... I haven't had enough time to watch all of these. I think I watched part of Circumnavigating Ring, which was pretty good, and part of the Ring Legacy, which was pretty good. Then, of course, we got Ring 2, which has... Spiral, George Ida's 1998 uh, original sequel to Ring that was released right around the same time. The Psychology of Fear, a newly edited archival interview with author Koji Suzuki of the novel. You have more theatrical trailers and then a reversible sleeve again. So that's Ring 2 for you. And then we have the Ring Zero Blu-ray. This one has... Audio commentary by author and critic Alexandra Heller Nicholas. Then we have Spooks, Size, and Videotape, a new video essay by Chris, critic Jasper Sharp on the J-Horror phenomenon. Arch archival behind-the-scenes featurette, deleted scenes, theatrical trailers, and another reversible sleeve. Now inside these, you know, this is how the, the DVDs look. They basically have the artwork also on the DVD, which is pretty cool. So this is a pretty sweet release, pretty stylish, right? Pretty stylish. Now, another big reason why I got this is because of this Spooks size and videotape, which I've heard some good things about. You know, it's a video essay, but uh, it's by one of the Midnight Eye guys, Jasper Sharp, who I've never really had problems with. But, you know, if you, if you watch my Death of J-Horror video from last year, there was an 80-minute video where I just was shellacking these, these guys on... Uh, on their opinions of Japanese horror. So I was wondering if Jasper Sharp's video essay would be very, um, how would I say? Not, uh, I say, misrepresentative of the industry. But it really kind of wasn't. It was actually a pretty solid video essay. It actually goes through a lot of the history 
that led up to Ring in terms of the cultural influence, uh, the, the folklore and the legends behind it and stuff like that. And then it goes through some of the Japanese movies around Ring's release and a little bit after. And then once he starts to get past the ring, like during the, the last five minutes or so, is where he starts to kind of fall apart a little bit. Uh, you know, again, it's another great opportunity to kind of bring to light some Japanese horror films that people ignore, but again, they didn't really do it. And again, you know, their definition of J-horror is not something that I would agree with in general, but regardless, it's, uh, it's a good video essay. So, a bunch of special features. You get the original four films. Now, in terms of my thoughts of the films themselves, you could just go to my Asian horror playlist and look up the years of each film. And I, I talk about each film each year. So, um, if I had to rank them, Raisin is definitely at the bottom. Yeah, Spiral's definitely at the bottom. And then you get Ring 2 above that. And I did enjoy Ring 2. Ring 2's pretty good, despite its flaws. And then Ring Zero, which is a prequel, is uh, very good. It's my second favorite. And then you get Ring is my favorite. So it's a pretty good, pretty good series of films until you get to the later stuff, and then it really starts to fall apart. <laughs> but the first four are all kind of worth watching, even Raisin, which I didn't even like, but uh, it's worth watching. Some people like it a lot more than I do. So that's Ring for you. That was a big one. Big time release and very worthy. Again, put that on your radar. The Bloodthirsty Trilogy. Yes. Also known as the Toho Vampire Trilogy. At least that's what I've seen it referred to. These were directed by Michio Yamamoto. Another Arrow release. But this one is Region A. So you get all three of these movies. All right. You get Vampire Doll. Lake of Dracula, and Evil of Dracula. Now, again, I reviewed all these in my Asian horror playlist. These are Japanese vampire films from the 1970s. And uh, they took influence, I believe, from the Hammer horror films. And you could see kind of... I've been actually watching more Hammer horror films over the past year or so. And uh, you could definitely see some of the influences in it. So if you want, like, the Japanese kind of classic vampire films, these are the ones to pick up. This is this is a pretty cool set. It's got uh, newly translated English subtitles. You get a, a video appraisal by a critic and writer, Kim Newman, on the Bloodthirsty Trilogy. Stills Gallery, original trailers, and a reversible sleeve. So again, this is a good release as well. So if you open this up, Pretty, pretty good stuff. I like the artwork. The Vampire Doll has its own disc. And then the other two films are on their own disc. Uh, on one disc there as well. And then it looks like we got a little booklet here. Which I haven't even... don't even believe I looked at yet. So you get this... Yeah. Some pretty good stuff. I like all three movies. Uh, depending on who you're talking to. People just like... Everybody has a different favorite. It really, I see it all, you know, kind of um, a mixed bag in terms of people that have seen these movies. Everybody likes, you know, different ones. They rank them in different orders and everything. I really don't have a favorite per se. I mean, I think they're all three of them are, are about the same quality, I would think. They're, and they're all different enough to be distinctive. So look up my uh, mini reviews in my Asian horror playlist from the 1970s. I think should have all three of them in those videos. And you get another write-up from Jasper Sharp here. Bloodlines, the genealogy of Michio Yamamoto's Bloodthirsty Trilogy. So I'm going to have to read this, too. I should probably cover these movies separately someday. Maybe in a, a, a next October or something. Maybe I'll review them separately and give them more focus. Nice to see these get good release, though. Again, another very good pickup here. Oh, i got to put this back in the case here. Yes, good stuff. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now we get to all the individual stuff that I bought. 
video might be a little long, but who cares? Go get some apple cider and cinnamon sticks. Oh, and another thing is that the case, the outer case, it feels like it's like... I don't know, it feels really, uh, really high quality, almost like velvet or something. Like, that's what comes to mind. Obviously, it isn't, but that's what it feels like. So that's a good release. All right, let's do Hong Kong movie first. Now, this is one I have not reviewed in my Asian horror playlist yet. The Keeper of Darkness. And um, I will review this. When I hit 2015 in my playlist. So I don't want to tell you too much yet. Um, this is one where Nick Chung directed and acted in it. Which he's been doing a bit lately. I like Nick Chung. And uh, basically it's, it's kind of a fantasy horror drama romance hybrid. This has a different feel to it for sure. You know it's about a a streetwise exorcist who befriends a lady journalist while investigating the history of a mysterious killer entity. Um, I really liked the the character interaction and the dramatic elements in this film. It kind of gives it a heart. And, uh, you know, it does use some CGI, similar to what Rigor Mortis did uh, in terms of its CGI effects. But uh, regardless of that, I thought this was a good flick, man. I look forward to watching it again. I only saw it one time. So I'm really looking forward to re-watching this. I might even watch it this month for my October Horror Challenge. But uh, I won't be reviewing this until uh, we get to... Uh, well, we are in 2015, aren't we? So, yeah. So this will be coming up probably early next year. I'll review it in my Asian Horror Playlist. Now we got a Mainland. I believe this is a Mainland Horror film. Let me look it up real quick here. Yes, I believe it is a mainland film. The Chrysalis. Now, I reviewed this in my 2013 Asian Horror Playlist video. This is a good little film. A lot of people haven't seen it. It's a little uneven at times. You basically have this, this girl, she gets kidnapped by her, her friend who's a little crazy. She tries to escape, but gets knocked out in the process. And then she wakes up on the side of the road like three months later. And she has no idea what's been going on for the past three months or what happened. And it goes from there. So I think it's, uh, this movie's pretty disorienting. And uh, it's actually quite good. It's pretty psychological. And pretty fun to watch. I like it. Chrysalis. I'm not even, not even sure what the availability on this is anymore. Oh, my, uh, I keep forgetting sometimes. Keeper of Darkness, which was a region, uh, all region release with English subs, no special features. Chrysalis, this one I believe is region, doesn't even say on it. I believe this one was a region three release with subs. It's worth watching. Check out my mini review for more, more information on that. Go back to Hong Kong. The Seventh Curse, yes. The Seventh Curse. This is the U.S. release. All region, actually. Now this... I got a full-length review of this sucker on my channel. Full-length review of The Seventh Curse. Spoiler-free. Check out what I think about it. Uh, I remember liking this the first time I saw it years ago, and then I rewatched it twice this year, and it shot up to being one of my favorite nutty Hong Kong films from the 80s. This is just, this is ridiculous. Some Basically some dude, it has some similarities to The Boxer's Omen, which is probably one reason why I like this so much. Some dude gets cursed uh, by some tribe in the middle of nowhere. He goes back home, and he has to go back and get like, he needs to to cure his curse. And it shows Chai Yun Fat on the front, but he's in the film for like two minutes. It's that typical false advertising thing. But this is naughty. It's it's like horror comedy action. You got like demon things running around, all kinds of crazy stuff. It's good stuff. If you like nutty 
crazy movies, you gotta watch The Seventh Curse, man. I think it's from the director of Ricky O, too. So, I mean, come on. Seventh Curse is a lot of fun. Alright, that's the Hong Kong Chinese stuff. No special features on that. Now, we've got the Korean stuff. We got only two. We got two Korean releases here. First one is one of the scarier films from recent years, actually. The Blu ray DVD combo pack, the US Region 1 release of Gonjiam Haunted Asylum. Again, I have a full length review of this on my channel, spoiler free. This movie was good. This is uh, significantly better than some of the other Korean found footage horror films that I've covered in my Asian horror playlist. Remember they came out with that Haunted House project back in like 2011? That movie stunk. So they've improved their game. No special features. But it's this movie actually moves at a good clip. I mean, they're at the, they're at the Haunted Asylum within like 20, 25 minutes. And then stuff starts going bad. And there's some good set pieces in this. I think the uh, the filmmakers had a certain patience with this film. They let the scares set up, and then they drag them out a little bit. They weren't like cheap jump scares. There's not too many cheap jump scares in this, which I appreciated. You know, some of the scares last like a long time. And you're sitting there with this person, and uh, stuff keeps going down. And it's just like one long scene of just pretty pretty scary stuff. So this is this is good. I like this. Yes, I will definitely watch that one again at some point. Now we have another one that's kind of a found footage film. Very obscure one. Navigation. This is the Region 3 release. Does it have... I think this had subtitles. Yeah, this is the Korean release. I got this off of Yes Asia. I was scouring Yes Asia to find any Korean horror films I haven't seen that looked like they had uh, enough of uh, a budget or a legit release in their home countries that I should check out. This movie's, it's all right. It's, it's okay. It's basically, you know, some people are driving to like some desolate area. They see a car accident. You know, the people are already dead. And for some reason, I forgot the reason, they pick up the, the GPS device that's lying on the, on the crash site. And then they follow it to its destination. I'm trying to remember if there was like a, an actual legit reason for it or not, but I don't remember. <laughs> so obviously they follow this GPS device and they get to a place that's not very good. I mean, it sounds pretty creepy, but it, it, it really isn't. It, it takes too long to get going. You know, it's one of those films, like, it's the opposite of going Gian. Like, it takes them a while to get to this place, and even when they get there, it takes a while to, to get a little creepy, and the payoff isn't really that great. It's it's okay, though. Like, the final half hour is pretty good. It just depends on whether you want to kind of wait that long to get there. So, obviously, Gong Jiam is your priority if you want a Korean found footage film. This one you could probably... It's it's right on the brink of recommendability, you know. But I'll cut... Uh, oh, actually, this is a 2014 film, I believe. So, uh, I'm going to start doing addendum, addendum videos to my Asian horror playlist for stuff that I've seen after the fact on years I've already covered. So I already covered 2014, but I saw this after. So, yeah, I'll cover this eventually, but not a big priority for you. So that's the two Korean pickups. Now, before we get to the Japanese, the rest of the Japanese haul, we got one loose end here. We got a loose end, and uh, it's a pretty bad one. I was actually looking forward to this, this Indonesian television series, because of the director. Half World, Season 1. Now, from what I've read, at least some episodes, if not all of them, were directed by our boy Joko Anwar. Well, Joko Anwar is a solid director. I've covered him multiple times in my... Um, Asian horror playlist. Let me fire up his filmography here just to make sure I don't miss anything. Now, he did Dead Time Kala, which was a pretty good flick. I think you, I saw that one on YouTube. 
That was a pretty good flick. The Forbidden Door, which is one of my favorite horror films of the 2000s. The Forbidden Door is phenomenal. I'm dying for someone to, to release that on DVD or Blu-ray or something. He did Ritual, which was good. He did Satan Slays, which was good. And he's got some coming up that look pretty good. So this, it's just... It, it's not listed on... Oh, no, television. Half Worlds, there we go. Okay. Just want to make sure I got my, my stuff straight. So Half Worlds is about... In the city of Jakarta. Here's your premise. Great premise. It's eight episodes, 30 minutes each. It's about clans of bloodthirsty creatures who fight one another secretly amidst the society of humans. This is easily the worst thing that Joko Anwar has ever directed that I've seen, and I can't imagine him doing anything much worse than this. Very clunky story, poorly written, boring to watch, really boring. Characters are wafer thin, they're lacking in personality, the dialogue is really lame. As gratuitous sex scenes, and I don't mind sex in, in movies and TV shows, but this, the ones in this show are just annoying. Acting is pretty wooden and sleep-inducing. There is a bit of bloody violence to enjoy in this, which is like its only saving grace, but it doesn't really save it. It's just uh, the fight scenes themselves are marred by editing problems, shaky cam, lazy lighting tactics like strobes and crap. And then the ending is a dumb cliffhanger to season two, which I will never watch. So, yeah, this was this was a blind buy that I wish I could take back. This was pretty painful to sit through. Half Worlds. Man, Joko, what are you doing to me? That was that was a bad series. All right, let's do the Japanese stuff. We got a handful here. Get a big one. Separate review on my channel. It comes. This is the Japanese Region 2 release without subs. Oh yeah, and Half Worlds was the uh Half Worlds was the Region 4 Australian release. Alright, so yeah, the It Comes, man. Pretty solid stuff. Check out my full length spoiler free review. Great cast. Tetsuya Nakashima is the director. A little on the long side in terms of runtime. It is over two hours long, but the, it looks fantastic. It's interesting. Even without subtitles, I found it interesting to watch. This is a movie that I, I will definitely re-watch quite a bit. It's got some pretty, pretty good set pieces as well. It comes. It's basically... Uh, I'll just check out my review. You'll... Uh, You'll have an idea what it is. It's it's kind of it's a supernatural horror film, but it doesn't fall into a lot of the I guess cliches that people typically associate with Japanese ghost films. So it's a little it's different enough to be memorable and it's very well made. Now the next two Japanese films are from the mid two thousands, and a lot of people don't like them. <laughs> but there's just something there's just something about Jurei the Uncanny Man, directed by Koji Shiraishi. The guy who directed Noroi and a bunch of really good or really interesting um, horror films over the past like 15 years. This was his first, at least this is the first film that got a release to international audiences. This is an anthology. It's got cliche upon cliche on it. It's got ghost girls and, and might have some creepy kids in it and everything. There's just something about the way this is done. It's almost like you could call it like fast food. Uh, popcorn j j horror but i just it's it's fun to watch i don't know what it is it like goes in reverse chronological order but it just check out my review check out my 2004 asian horror playlist videos i don't know there's just something about this i haven't seen it in a while so i'm kind of looking forward to uh uh to it i think i think this is the one that has like it has one really memorable scene where someone dies, like a ghost kills someone, and in the same shot, the person is resurrected as a as an evil ghost. In the same shot. So I was like, there is, I'm telling you, there are a few good moments in this. I think people just razz on it just because it's got Onryo ghosts in it. 
which is pretty common, right? But this is the Region 1 release. Jure, the uncanny. <laughs> Here's another one. This is actually not really a horror film. Actually, now that I think about it, but oh well. I guess it's kind of. This is Sodom the Killer, which is really more of a comedy action flick with some horror elements in it. Um, if you want to check out, check out Roger Swan's review. Swan's Japanese Horror. Ch type in YouTube, Swan's Japanese Horror Reviews. Sodom the Killer. He, him and his buddy, uh, I'll review this for like five minutes, and it's, uh, they give you a good idea what to expect. There are a few little spoilers they give you. It's so hard to describe this movie. In fact, it has, the DVD has premiere footage, like of the premiere, and the premiere wasn't a big deal. This is low budget, like, kind of like Jure the Uncanny, just low budget uh, stuff. But this is more like a cult film. It's, it's got, like, uh, you have this, like, evil dude, he's, like, he's got his band of people, and he, like, has this diabolical plan that doesn't really make any sense, and your protagonist is, like, a girl with, like, this magic gun, and, and she, like, every time she shoots, she misses the bad guy and hits innocent bystanders by mistake. <laughs> They're just, like, this movie is nuts. It's like low budget, just freaking, just nuts. There's stuff that makes no sense, but it's meant to be funny. Because if you look at the premiere footage, after you watch the movie, or even before you watch it, you could, you could watch the premiere. Uh, to give you an idea, they were totally playing the whole movie for laughs. But they do it in a way that's actually pretty freaking funny. I like this one. It's, it's not going to be for most people, but uh, it's... It's pretty, pretty nutty, B-grade schlock, in a good way. In a good way. <sighs> I, gotta, I gotta do a double header of those. Sat on the killer and Jure the uncanny one night. Maybe I'll add the crone on top of it. The Exorcist Nurse. This film is from which year? The Exorcist Nurse is from... 2018 so i'll get to this one when i hit my asian horror playlist from 2018 this is the japanese region 2 release without subtitles i saw it it's uh yeah take it or leave it exorcist nurse what were my what do my notes say so you basically have a young female patient, all right? This obviously takes place mostly at a hospital, as, as you might expect. And uh, a young female patient complains of odd rashes on her body that have no apparent physical cause. Then you have a, a male patient tries to hang himself for no apparent reason. So, you know, stuff's going down. You have a young nurse um, who tries to figure things out. There's a paranormal force at play. So I think, like, you know, the aesthetics of this film are actually pretty good. Scoring and sound design is, is pretty solid. You know, overall, it's not a bad film. It has a little bit of an ominous feel to it. Complete lack of color. I mean, there's basically just white and black. They, they may as well have just have shot it in black and white anyways, because there's no color to it. Which, if you, you if you do, you've seen some of my reviews of horror films, you know, it's a I like colorful horror films in general. It gives me, I don't know, there's just something about it. There's something about the contemporary view that horror films should not have color and everything be drained out uh, that kind of annoys me. So anytime I see a film where it's just like not, it, I don't know, it doesn't have to be like a Dario Argento film, but I want to see some vibrancy to the visuals, you know what I mean, something. And this really doesn't have that. Uh, a few decent scares, but overall, it's just kind of mediocre. You know, it kind of tries to do its own thing, but it's, the problem with this is that it doesn't really build to a climax. When it ends, you're just like, that's it, that's it. So, Exorcist Nurse, I would not really recommend, but I'll, I'll do a mini-review when we get further along in the Asian Horror Playlist.
let's let's do this one last. Let's knock out the two films I bought on my Japanese vacation last year. Yes, the next two films I bought a year ago, last October, when I went to Japan. You got uh, live broadcast of death. I figured, hey, you know, it's a found footage film. It'd be a little, a little creepy, right? Live broadcast of death. I'm not even gonna to describe the plots of these. These are this is a region two release without subs. You could probably only get in Japan anyway. Not good. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna tell you. Let me look at my notes real quick. See what I got here. Live broadcast. You basically have. Ooh, an email link is sent from an unknown address, and somebody is stupid enough to open it, and they see a woman running with scissors. So it sounds like Kuchisake Ona, right? Sounds like the Slipmouth woman, but it, it, it really isn't. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> she's like a combination of the Slipmouth woman with her scissors and an Onryo ghost. They're kind of like smashed together in this villain, uh, which isn't a bad idea, but, uh, yeah. A lot of filler material and bad acting in it. I guess that's kind of like the biggest problem with this. It's got to be eventful. You got to try to make it somewhat eventful, and this movie doesn't do that. Then we have a Kokuri-san film again, which there's been a number of these. Kokuri-san, Geki Joban, Shintashi, Denzetsu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kuchisake Ona. Or, I mean, I'm sorry. Kokori-san. I'm having a brain fart here. So you basically have, uh, you know, Kokori-san. You have a fortune-telling game. It's kind of like uh, Ouija board type stuff. Bad stuff happens. People begin dying one at a time. It's just not very good. Just kind of an awkward film. Acting is poor again. Again, it doesn't build to a climax. It's just kind of low-grade. There is this creepy lady which bandaged up with blood on her mouth. Which was actually used in a Tomie film at one point. That visual. I'd rather just watch the Tomie film instead of this again. So. Sometimes when I do blind buys in Japan. It just. After I watch them when I get home. I'm like. Why did I do that? Although these. I've been getting good. Because I go to book off now when I'm in Japan. So I could get these for like 5 bucks. Or 500 yen. You know what I mean? So they're cheap. They're dirt cheap. But. You know. The majority of the ones I've bought just aren't very good. I'd say the best ones I got, the best one by far, is Egg uh, from Yukikiko Tsutsumi. I think, did I review that in the 2002 or 2005 playlist video? I don't remember, but that's the one where the, the girl's got an egg in her head visually and a monster busts out of it and she starts like going crazy. Egg was a good one. I blind bought that one in Japan. The other one I liked was uh, Zom Video, which I bought uh, a few years ago, and I covered that in my playlist, I think, as well. So that, there's a few good ones that I've gotten, but I'd say the majority have just turned out to be kind of worthless, kind of like a direct-to-video movie in America. You know what I mean? Now, will I buy a few more this year when I go to, when I go to Japan for my next vacation? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Parasite. This is the anime series and both live action film box set from Malaysia. So all region. The anime is awesome. The anime Parasite's one of my favorite anime series that I've seen. It's really good. It's got good side characters, really it's got a nicely written conflict to it. And uh, you know, you basically have parasites come down to earth and uh they secretly take over. It's almost like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but with souped-up powers. These, you know, when it invades the human body, you end up with uh, some pretty deadly, um, some very deadly, like, uh, biological abilities that these things have. And the protagonist has one that only partially invaded his body, so it only invaded his arm. It didn't make it to his brain. So that he's kind of like the good guy with kind of an alien on, attached to his arm. It's, watch the anime. It's phenomenal. Really good. 
Now, the two live-action films, I reviewed the first one in my Asian Horror Playlist video from 2014, and I will review the second one when we get to 2015. Now, the live-action films are solid, especially if, if it's, uh, you know, it's similar to, like, like if you watch Halloween 2 immediately after Halloween 1, the John Carpenter film, it's like, it pales in comparison. It's not as good of an experience, whereas if you watch Halloween 2, you know, and you haven't seen the first Halloween in like a year, Halloween 2 comes off as a pretty solid movie. And it's similar to these Parasite live action films. If you watch the live action films and you haven't seen the anime, or haven't seen the anime recently, they come off as just solid. In fact, uh, I actually think they're very good adaptations for the screen. <clears throat> I mentioned in my review of the first one, it reminded me of Venom, the Venom movie, but way better, way better script writing and uh way more interesting to watch so you know just to give you an idea of what to expect there so yeah both live action films i think are solid and uh like i said i'll review the second one when we get to uh maybe part three or four in the asian horror playlist maybe even part five when i rewatch it again i might elevate it to the to the to near the top so we'll see but yes this is totally worth buying and this was reasonably priced the Malaysian releases usually are. And English subtitles and everything. So that's it. Get some long videos this week. Some long videos. So that's the horror haul from, from recent months. And a few from last year. And uh, you know, I'll continue adding to my collection. If you noticed, I've been adding more Blu-rays recently. I don't want to upgrade <clears throat> everything. Because that would be way too expensive. So I'm going for, uh, usually my Blu-ray purchases will be on stuff that I don't have in the collection yet. But, uh, you know, I'm adding, I'm adding to it. So, as always, I'll see you next time.